So today I get to talk about the second part of our vision series. Who liked last week? Who liked where we're going as a church? Anybody? Hopefully everyone. So right, we are in our second week of a seven-week series. Um, it's our vision series. And we've laid out the things that you're going to hear consistently, eternally, as long as Rock Church exists. And here's the four things. You're going to know God. We're going to be people that find family. We're going to live kingdom-centered lives. And we're going to be on mission together. Those things are going to echo a lot in our services. They're going to be things that we say to people all the time. We think that if you can kind of rally around a single mission that's clear and spelled out, you build unity, right? And we're meant to be a church together. Like this is, ministry is not about me. It's not about my dad. It's not about any leader up here. It's about us working together to bring people the kingdom of God. And everybody said, yep. See, you guys really got to get that. When I say something like that, you say Amen. So I'm doing the second part, and here's what it is. Come on, hold on. So find family. I'm going to start with a couple of quotes I actually read this morning, if you don't care. Here's the first one. This was so good, I had to share it. One way to cultivate love in your heart for other Christians. Imagine them in their fully redeemed, glorified state. Remember that this is their true identity and how you will know them for all eternity. And then relate to them now in light of this future reality. You know, I got a brother that's really good at that. Joe, are you in here? <laughs> but imagine them in their fully redeemed, glorified state. Remember that's their identity and how you will know them for all eternity. This life is just a glimpse. It's just a blip in eternity. One day they'll be fully glorified, right? So imagine them in that state. We all are fallen. We all have issues. Some of us are really hard to love. I'm one of them, right? But imagine me in my glorified state with no sin on me anymore, right? Then love me from that place, right? Here's the second one. I don't know what these have to do with my message, maybe a little bit. Discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. Craig Rochelle said that. Discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. I thought that was super applicable to the Christian life in that what we want most is Jesus Christ. But moment to moment, sometimes in the now, that's not what I want most. I want my way. Right? I want the things and the desires and the pleasures and the things, the immediate gratification all the time. Right? But if we can live in light of this eternal call, the thing that I want most, and discipline myself to do the right things, discipline myself enough to wake up in the morning and read the word, knowing what I want most, I may not taste right this second. Right? But the discipline, the day-to-day -day actions of prayer and Bible reading, one day he's going to glorify me more and more, and I'll be in better and closer relationship to him than I ever have. Those were two nuggets that had nothing to do with my sermon, but I wanted to share them. Cool? So here's my opening verse today. Find family. Find family. Opening verse is this. John 13, verses 34 and 35. This is Jesus speaking. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, you could sit there and chew on that verse all day long and just say this over and over again. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Do you think that we fully grasp the depth of his love for us? Do you think that for a lifetime we're going to be searching that out, that love? So can I walk out of here today and be like, I'm just going to love everybody better? No, but can I walk out of here today and get in this word and pray and learn more and more and more about how much he loves me? Can I learn to magnify the cross? See, the cross is the act. It's the act that God left us that shows us the depth of Jesus' love for us. You understand that? 
that central act, that thing that made no sense. Why would a perfect man that has never done anything wrong lay his life down with the most gruesome death possible for a sinner like me? You guys, that is so much bigger than we realize. And can I tell you something? It's not a myth. It's a historical fact. Do you know that? No other faith stands on facts like Christianity does. And he did it for us. So I'm kind of starting off with the conclusion of my message, and I never do that. But it's true. If we can learn to understand the depth of his love for us, we will love one another like he told us to. And what's interesting in that passage is he had just washed the disciples' feet. And he told them, he goes, you won't understand this, what I'm doing, until later. And I think what he was saying was this. Jesus was going to die. He was going to lay his life down and be resurrected. And they would really fully realize, although they, I think they were convicted of it, would fully realize that God in flesh, who was the perfect man, was washing my feet and then would go and lay his life down for me. The depth of that. He showed us what modeling love was. So let's talk about finding family. Let's talk about what God says, what the Word says. I'm going to go through a couple scriptures that we're going to use. Um, I want to pause here, and I want to tell you that in three or two more weeks after this week, we're going to start a three-week series. Now, this three-week series inside of this seven-week series is an actual step-by-step class that's going to lead in some of you being members of our church. If you've never been baptized, um, all the steps are going to be laid out for you to become a member. We're super excited about it as a staff. We're praying and believing that we'll have at least 50. I'm believing we'll break that pretty easily. Um, But here's the thing, and I need to tell you this. In order for you to be a member on that fourth week, you have to be at all three of the classes. Does that make sense? Now, it's not a big deal if you miss one. We're going to have makeups, obviously. But if you can at all possible be here for those three weeks, be here. Cool? Sorry, announcement, pause. So 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5 says this, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood each one of us, a stone being built up into one body. Can I say something that a lot of times in our culture, we have this individualistic identity. It's all about me, I. The Bible has a lot of we language. A lot of times we read scripture thinking that it's talking about you as an individual, when really it's talking about us as a body. When you see us do corporate confession, I understand that sometimes I'm confessing something that maybe I don't, but what I am doing, I'm standing in my brother's place, united together and saying, I know some people in here deal with this. We are all sinners, and we have the freedom to admit that together. Do you understand that? Ephesians 2.19 says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. God, our identity, if you read through this right here, is a holy priesthood. We're no longer strangers and aliens. We were disconnected from God, but now all of us who are believers in this room are a part of the same family. And there's something deeper about a spiritual family than an actual blood family. Jesus said himself, some will leave mothers and fathers. He actually uses the word hate. I won't go into that. But what he's saying is there's a deep bond here. This goes deeper than blood. This spiritual thing, being in Christ as one body. We should love each other so much so it makes absolutely no sense. I'm going to get more into that in a little bit. I won't skip ahead. So there's actually four ways or four areas I want to give you guys on how to be in family, how to find family, how to be the type of family that we're called to be and what we're going to really focus on at Rock Church. The first thing you need to do to be a part of a family like God's called us to is you need to commit. Commitment. I want you to write that down. Acts 2.42 says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. There's something I see in our society a lot, and it's that we idolize the family. We idolize our kids' sports. We idolize, it's the perfect excuse you can use any time to get out of something to do with church. 
oh, my kids had a soccer game. Or, oh, I was just tired of my husband. It's, it's always an excuse, right? But in the Word, it says they devote him themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. We have to be people that commit to this family as much as we do our own. And we're going to get into more of why. Let me, for, from personal example, let me tell you, when we first decided to start our kingdom community, I don't know how long ago, three or four years ago, I had read Dallas Willard. I had learned really what love actually looked like. Like learning to love people that I'm not comfortable with. And I can be an absolute testimony that I've gotten closer to people significantly in the last three or four years, and it's been such a blessing. People that I maybe not would have chose three or four years ago. People that probably definitely would not have chose me. Right? But we've learned to love people with our differences because there's one thing that unites us closer than anything, and that's Jesus. And when you stay with him over the long haul, it's even more beautiful because they start to get more authentic and real and talk about their sins, and I still love them, and I really know them. You know that quote? To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. You can't really love someone unless you really know them. Well, we're a society that's cut off. Shallow relationships. No one really knows people. We're more connected than we've ever been, but more disconnected relationally. And it's causing all kinds of problems. You were not meant to live this Christian life and do it on your own. You're meant to do it in community. And that doesn't just mean coming, sitting in a message on Sunday, and going out in your life. It means being deeply connected and involved in a family. So, for commitment, I want to give you three things. Three things that will help with commitment. Number one, instead of creating an excuse, create a reason. Whomever you're with in the various spheres of life, church, family, friends, school, work, create reasons to go deeper with them. Discover the unseen stories and histories surrounding you. Be more curious. Ask more questions. Listen more intently. See, few of us, you know, we always think, I know they want me to go to kingdom community. I know they want. And then, have you ever tried to take the opposite approach? I need to go to love others. I need to go to pour out. God has called me to do a work, not just to be worked on. A lot of our transformation is in the doing, not receiving. Actually walking the life out. I don't care if you've messed up this week. Go love somebody else and get your eyes off of you and onto somebody else. That is an absolute cure for some of our problems. Number two, instead of activating and waiting, deactivate and be present. So when you're with people, here's, I want you to watch this. I'm going to give you a physical illustration. Here's activating and waiting. You show up to KC. Hey, guys, what's up? How many of you have seen that before? They sit down. They're in a group, but they're not really there. You've activated, and now you're waiting on someone else to start a conversation. What if you did the opposite? What if you deactivated and you were present? And here's what it says. When you're with others, shut off your phone or leave it in your pocket. Give people the gift of your undivided attention. It will feel strange at first, but this is an integral step in the process of fostering genuine community. I've tried this, and I can be honest with you, I'm definitely guilty of what I just did. It's awkward when you try to be fully present. A lot of times you're starting the conversations. Everyone else is on their phones. But imagine a church in a body where we actually enjoyed and loved to talk to one another. I know, it's crazy, right? (laughs) Can you imagine? Number three, instead of making your escape, make a commitment. Maybe your church doesn't look, sound, or feel exactly like your dream church. Regardless, make a commitment. In fact, make several commitments to stay, to serve, to rejoice when others are rejoicing, to mourn when they're mourning, to come alongside, to love in ways that cost you. Guys, we live by the way of the cross. We live by laying our lives down and doing things that are uncomfortable. Loving people for me is uncomfortable. When people start to cry in front of me, I'm like, eh. I'm going to be honest, it's, it's hard, right? But I know that's what I'm called to. It's carrying my cross. God is transforming me in those moments, and I'm learning to love people like I never have before. And you know what that Harvard study showed that makes people the most happy in the world? 
relationships. 75-year study, the number one thing that makes people happier than anything else is satisfying, secure relationships. Imagine a church body that lived like they should, that loved like they should. You have a room full of people right here that we can be connected to. But are you going to go home and hermit? Are you going to go home and be by yourself? Or are you going to lay your life down and enjoy people? Sounds like a daunting task, doesn't it? It's funny when you think about it. So that's the first part, commitment. Commit to community. The second one is this, humility. We're going to be a community of humility. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. It's funny that he says this. When it's talking about being kind to one another, he says this, Forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. There's going to be in any community, in any church, in any human relationships, there's going to be conflict. Why? We're sinful. People sin. People mess up. But here is what absolutely covers that in love, is when I can look at them and be like, I sin too. Christ died for me just like he died for you. I'm no better than you. You're not worse than me right? We are families of the household of God. We are a royal priesthood. We are what the word says we are, and I'm going to love you anyway. I don't care if you're the biggest drug addict, whatever you are, I'm going to love you as you are no worse than I am. That's backwards. That is backwards in our culture. We are a culture of self-righteousness where everybody thinks they're better than the other person. I see it in politics. I see it in everything. When you're a Christian, you stand here and you say, you know what, I know I'm terrible. There's one person that was good, and his name was Jesus. I don't get to choose my own morality by my feelings. My morality is determined by the word of God. And guess what? Sometimes I don't like it all. Am I being too hard? Here's the second thing about, there's this beautiful passage. It's probably one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible on, on humility. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Let's go there real quick. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then it says this. This is the passage. There's actually a poem that Paul wrote. I wish we could read it in Hebrew, but I'm not that smart. Have this mind amongst amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, if you sit there and you meditate on that, I would like you to meditate on that this week. Go read that and sit there and think about it. God in the flesh humbled himself to the point of death. He served all of those around him. He laid down his kingship and did something that was completely opposite of what we think he should have done. Because he could have came like a real king. I'm going to rule this world and crush everybody that's against me. He did the exact opposite. He lays down his life. He washes disciples' feet. He lives, I'm not going to say that, completely contrary to what we would do unfortunately, in the same situation, in what we often do in our own lives. So when we're in conflict with one another, when we see things, if we start to see them humbly like this, lay my life down, if I start to see you as more significant than myself, and please understand I'm preaching to myself here. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this in his book, Life Together, which is one of the best books on Christian community, if you've never read it. If my sinfulness appears to me to be in any way smaller or less detestable in comparison with the sins of others, I am still not recognizing my sinfulness at all. 
How can I possibly serve another person in unfeigned humility if I seriously regard his sinfulness as any worse than my own? We have to learn as a body to see one another like that. You have to learn to see me like that, to see my dad like that. I want you to see me as a sinner, but I want you to see yourself as a sinner as well. We need to learn to see ourselves as bigger sinners. Because God is unveiling these things to our hearts. Guess what? He's not unveiling things about other people to you, about their hearts. That's not your job. That's his job. That is why you should be able to see yourself in that light, more so than other people. But unfortunately, we are way better at the other way. How many in here are pretty good at picking out other people's problems? Yeah? I'm an expert. But I tell you what, the more God, the more you get closer to Jesus, the more your eyes are fixed on him, and he starts to show you how great he is and how little you are, nothing has given me more compassion for other people. Nothing has given me more love for other people than that. The last thing, or no, not the last thing. The third thing is accountability. Man, this is a hard one for us in our culture. My brothers, James 9, or 5, 19, 20, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has a great power as it is working. And then I'm going to say one more quote and then I'm going to elaborate. Bonhoeffer says this, nothing can be more cruel than the leniency which abandons others to their sin. Nothing can be more compassionate than the severe reprimand which calls another Christian in one's community back from the path of sin. That sounds really hard, but here's what, I'm, well, here's what he's saying. If we understood how absolutely terrible, I wish I had a better word there, sin is and what it does to our lives and the pain that it causes, we would take it way more seriously when our brothers and sisters are caught up in it. Now, I'm not telling you to go chastise them and yell at them and beat them down. But what if we saw something in one of each other's eyes and we were so open to critique and criticism and love from others that we had the freedom to go say, brother, I see this in your life and it's going to hurt you. It's the enemy's plan. It's not God's plan. And I love you and I don't want you to do that. And imagine that we didn't get offended when they said it. Did you hear that part? Imagine we didn't get offended. We don't live in a culture like that. I'm going to be honest with you. I have a hard time with it. I had someone call me out on Facebook this week, and they were right, and I about died. I wish Ellen was here. It was Ellen. I'll just call her out. Yeah, she messages me. She's like, hey, I think you were unnecessarily snarky. <laughs> like, no, I wasn't. <laughs> um. No, but immediately I was like, oh, I was mad. I'm like, what? They're snarky. And then I saw, thought about it, and I'm like, gosh, you're right. You're right. But can I be honest with you? The freedom to do that only comes from acknowledging that I know I'm going to mess up, that I know I'm sinful. And when you get into community, when you find family that loves you enough and acknowledges who we are in God, acknowledges our depravity, right? We don't have anything to worry about. They can call me whatever they want. No matter what, I'm good with Jesus. That's all that matters. But I can listen humbly and be like, what's true in what they're saying? Does it line up with the word of God? If it does, I'm going to listen and I'm going to change and I'm going to repent and confess and do the things the word of God tells me to do. So dad's always had this vision of Rock Church. He has said it. If you've been here for any significant amount of time, he wants to be a church of love. Loving people has always been his thing, and I do think this church radiates that. It's honestly made me really uncomfortable for a long time. Like, Bob hugs me all the time, and I'm like... <laughs> but I get it, right? It's also the thing that draws people to this church, right? It's the thing people understand and realize, and I know that's what God calls us to. So the last one is being a community of love. Dallas Willard says this, the aim of God in history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons 
with himself included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. Our dream and our vision, right, is a community of loving persons. I want you to imagine that we're all Jesus. Do you know what kind of party that would be? It would be something this world has never experienced. When men would walk up to, to each other, they didn't have that little sizing up thing. Like, what's your job? How much do you lift, bro? Like, I'm being funny, but you know it's true. It's in every relationship that we have. Are they better than me? Am I better than them? Am I advanced in my career? Am I this? Am I that? Imagine if we just saw each other as Jesus. That's what God has called us to. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And here's what that says to me. That says this. You're going to sin, and you're going to sin, and you're going to sin, and you're going to sin. You're going to mess up, you're going to mess up. Through that, God's going to be transforming you. But my job as a believer and as your brother is to love you, to love you, to love you, to love you, to love you over and over and over again. John 3, and this is the commandment. I already said that. So the last thing I want to leave you, what it looks like to love well, and I love this. What it looks like to love well. Welcome unjust criticism. Welcome unjust criticism. My confidence is in Christ. People are going to criticize you, and they're going to criticize you unjustly. Can you stand with confidence in Christ and accept it humbly? and learn what truth may be in it. This is the hardest one for me, but it's so true and it's so good. As soon as we get prideful and we get defensive, we're not defending Jesus, we're defending me. I have confidence in Christ. Take what they say, learn from it, and respond completely contrary to how they expect you to respond. This is the one I'm worst at, by the way, I freely admit. Befriending those who annoy us, helping those who are ungrateful, Forgiving without condition, overlooking an offense, praying for your enemies. If you write those down and ponder it, then we are all terrible at almost every one of them. But that's what it looks like to love well. I want to end with a little story. So there's a myth, and it's not really a myth. It's actually pretty well documented in the first three centuries that the disciple John, who wrote five books in the New Testament, he wrote John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, that John, right, was doing ministry in Ephesus. And on his last days, they actually, he was so weak and frail that they would carry him in to say things. Well, he had one more message that he gave, and he was so weak he could hardly get it out. But he, they carried, his disciples carried him in on stage, and they set him there. And the only thing he said to them is this, little children, love one another. If you understand this, you understand everything else. We're talking about a person that walked with Christ. He said, little children, love one another. If you understand this, you understand everything else. That's what it looks like to be find family, to be in family that we've called to be. You all stand up with me? Pray us out, band, you can come. palms up. Father, we love you. We love you, Father, because you first loved us. We love you because you did the greatest act of love that's ever been done, Father. You sacrificed yourself for us as your friends, as your beloved children. You wanted nothing more than to be in relationship with us. We weren't worthy. We were undeserving. We're still undeserving, but yet you did it, and yet you love us that much. God, we just ask that you open our eyes to the depth of your love for us so I'm able to love others like you call me to do, Father. We pray for this church that it would be a family that loves one another like nobody's ever seen, that the people outside would look at it and be like, that's different and I want it. That's different and I want to be a part of it. That's what my soul needs is love in a hurting world where people don't love each other, where they hate each other through political divide and everything going on in our country, Father. May our church stand and be different and be loving. In your son's Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.